So we're going to learn about some simple gas laws. And these look at relationships between pairs of gas properties. There are four basic properties or variables that we can specify for a gas, and those will be the pressure, capital P, the volume, capital V, the temperature, capital T, and the amount of gas in moles, lowercase n. These properties um, depend on each other. If you change one, others will change. So the simple gas laws just look at two changing at once instead of all of them going up. I'm getting lost in my slides. Okay, so the first one I'm going to talk about is called Boyle's Law because a guy named Robert Boyle studied this. Um, I'm going to mention the names of the dates here. He lived back in the 1600s, and that was a really long time ago. Um, but I'm not going to test you on these. I'm not going to ask you what is Boyle's Law. I just want you to have heard of it. But I can't remember which is which. And ultimately, is that important? No, what's important is being able to come up with the correct equation and solve the problem. So what Boyle did is he took a J-shaped tube. Um, there's a gas in here, and this is closed off, and it's got mercury in it. Now looking at these mercury columns, the gas inside, is that a higher pressure or a lower pressure than outside? It's higher because it's pushing down, right? So then what he did is he took some mercury and poured mercury and more mercury in there. So that puts more pressure on the gas. And so that caused the gas to squish together, to compress. So knowing the diameter and the length of this space, you could calculate the volume. And without even doing a calculation, you can tell that the gas has a smaller volume there. So the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. We can measure the pressure by measuring the difference in the heights of the columns of mercury. So he observed an inverse relationship. If the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. If the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. They are oppositely related. So this is uh, Boyle's Law data changing the pressure and measuring the volume. At low pressure, the sample of gas had a high volume, and as the pressure was increased, the volume decreased. Now that's very nice and all, but it's more useful if we can get a straight line, because then we can have an equation and we can predict things. And so we like to make straight lines. I'm going to come back to that slide. So here's some similar data. Volume versus pressure. As the pressure increases, the volume decreases. That's volume versus pressure. If we graph volume versus the reciprocal of pressure, one divided by the pressure, we get a straight line. And that straight line is very useful because now we can predict what's happening in here more accurately. So Boyle's Law says that volume is proportional to 1 over the pressure. That is assuming that you keep the other variables constant. So you have to keep the temperature constant and the amount of gas constant in order for that to be true. What is that notation there? Volume? So this is, uh, means proportional to. So the volume is proportional to 1 over P, which means the volume equals some constant times 1 over P, or PV equals a constant. And so you can derive this equation, which I'm not going to make you do. But that's how we usually use Boyle's Law. P1V1 equals P2V2. And so what that means is that the pressure under one set of conditions times the volume under that set of conditions is equal to the pressure times the volume under in a different situation, provided the temperature and amount of gas are the same. Molecular interpretation of this law. So here we have a container whose volume can change. This lid can move up and down. Here there's a one kilogram weight sitting on the top 
And the reason this isn't collapsing and falling all the way down is that there's a gas in here that's holding it up. So just like in a bounce house, right? The bounce house is all flat and then they turn on the fan and it pumps air into there, right? And then you can go in there and you can jump on it, right? And there's nothing under you except air and yet it supports you. And so it can support significant amount of mass. And there's a gauge here that we can measure the pressure. So there's the same number of little green spheres in each of these containers. Here the volume is one liter. Here we've changed the volume so that it is half as big. It's half a liter. And then the pressure goes from one atmosphere to two atmospheres. You cut the volume in half, the pressure doubles. So one goes up, one goes down by the same factor. Here, a factor of two. What's happening? Well, when you compress this gas, when you take these particles and you put them into a smaller volume, they're going to run into the walls more frequently. And running into the walls is where the pressure comes from. So this is like kindergartners in a classroom, right? And the teacher stepped out and they're running around. They're going to run into each other, they're going to run into the walls. If you put those same kids in a room that's half as big, they're going to run into each other more frequently, right? Pressure actually has applications, pressure of gases has applications to all sorts of things. I'm not going to test you on anything about diving, but um, it's kind of interesting. So for every 10 meters of depth that you go underwater, a diver experiences an additional one atmosphere of pressure, because water is more dense than air, right? So going down 10 meters underwater, now you've got a pressure of two atmospheres on your body. You go down another so that you're 20 meters down, now there's a pressure of three atmospheres. That makes it a little difficult to breathe, right? Because you have to expand your lungs against a larger pressure. That's why to breathe down there, you need to be breathing a pressurized air. You do, you have to be very careful going up. There's a very good reason that they make you take classes and get certified before they let you go scuba diving because it's a very easy way to kill yourself or seriously mess yourself up. So down here, breathing air at a pressure of three atmospheres, if you were to rise to the surface without exhaling, if you held your breath, you get to the surface, now the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, the pressure's changed by a factor of three, what's that gonna do to the volume? It'll blow up your lungs, yeah. So it's important to be inhaling, exhaling, breathing as, as you rise up because the pressure is changing. There's a lot more to do with that. Okay, so this is, seems a little mean to me. The, here's our first gas law problem and it's not a super straightforward one. But that's okay, because we're in Chem 1A and we can handle this. So we read the problem. A snorkeler takes a syringe filled with 16 milliliters of air from the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere to an unknown depth. The volume of the air in the syringe at this depth is 7.5 milliliters. What is the pressure at this depth? If the pressure increases by one atmosphere for every additional 10 meters of depth, how deep is the snorkeler? Now, we can read through that and that might not really mean anything to us, right? So we're gonna focus on the numbers and sometimes we're gonna to need to draw a picture. This one being not straightforward might require a picture. And it doesn't need to be a pretty picture. I don't draw pretty pictures. So there's the surface of the water, okay? You get that. Here's my syringe and it's got some air in it. There's the little plunger, okay? So it says that it's got 16 milliliters of air. This is up at the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere. Well, actually it's 1.0. Okay, so I'm just drawing what the story problem is telling. And then it says, this. The syringe is taken 
to a lower lower part of the river or whatever it is. So I'm going to draw it again down here. And it says now the volume of the air is 7.5 milliliters. So the plunger has moved in. So 7.5 milliliters. So how would you get the volume of air in that syringe to be smaller? Yeah, you're gonna, we're going to use P1, V1, but you would, you would push on this, right? You'd push on the plunger, you'd put pressure on it, and squish the air together. Taking this underwater, the water puts pressure on the plunger and causes it to decrease in volume. So they're asking us to find what is the pressure at this depth. We knew the pressure up here, and this was the volume. Now a pressure, we're asked for the pressure down here, and here's the volume. So we can label these. We'll call this volume one, and this is pressure one. Those go together. This is volume two, and we're trying to find out What's the pressure down there? So we're going to use Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. We're solving for P2. I need to rearrange the equation. It's better to rearrange it before you put the numbers in. So I want P2 by itself. I'm going to divide both sides by V2. So the Vs cancel out. P2 equals P1, V1 over V2. There's lots of P's and V's and 1's and 2's, and it's easy to get them mixed up, so you have to write things down carefully. So pressure 1, I've labeled over here, is 1 atmosphere. Always write your units. Volume 1 is 16 milliliters. And I'm going to divide by volume 2, 7.5 milliliters. What happens with the units? The milliliters cancel out. OK. And I'm, I'm getting a pressure here. So my unit's going to be atmosphere, which is a unit of pressure. So that sounds good. So I've got 1 times 16 divided by 7.5. Calculator says 2.1333 repeating atmospheres. How many sig figs? Two. two. Right? Each of these numbers has two. So 2.1. So the pressure is 2.1 atmospheres. That's the answer to the first question. That part's not too bad. How deep is the snorkeler? Well, let's look, we can do better than just guessing. Okay, so let's think about this. We're told that you go down 10 meters, that's plus one atmosphere. And you go down another 10 meters, and that's plus another atmosphere. And what is it up here? One. One. So we need to figure out how much did the pressure increase? from where it was at the surface. So it's it's 2.1 down there, and it was 1.0 at the top, right? So if we subtract, the pressure has increased 1.1 atmospheres. I'm going to do this at the top. So we have an increase of 1.1 atmospheres, and this problem is telling us that it increases by one atmosphere for every 10 meters. So 10 meters for every one atmosphere increase. So 11 meters. 
11 meters below the surface. Problem solving and critical thinking. Expect to see more than one problem on the exam that's some weird scenario like this that we didn't talk about. The ingredients are all things that we've talked about, but then you have to think about it and figure it out. So we should be able to solve problems with everything we think about. We don't need anything like gravity or... No, this one needs no outside information. Now there are problems that do require some outside information. You might need a molar mass off the periodic table. You might need a unit conversion or something. Um, but we're not assuming any knowledge of physics here. Charles Law, named after J.A.C. Charles, lived in the 17 and 1800s. He looked at the relationship between volume and temperature. And he found that the volume of a gas was directly proportional to its absolute temperature. If you double the temperature, the volume doubles. The very, very important thing here is that we have to use Kelvins. Kelvin is the absolute temperature scale. It's absolute because zero is zero. Absolute zero, the lowest possible temperature. So we express this as V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Here's an example of some Charles Law data. So we have volume of the gas in liters versus the temperature. Um, these are different quantities of gas. They're all at the same pressure, but we're changing the amount of gas. And so that's why the lines have different slopes. Down here, the temperature is given in degrees Celsius and in Kelvins. Remember, a Kelvin and a degree Celsius are the same size of a unit. It's just that zero's in a different place. So the data here is a nice straight line for each of these. And if we take all of these and extrapolate these lines past the data, we find that they intersect at a point where the temperature is equal to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. And you can do this at different pressures and different amounts of gas, and it always ends up at that number. And that's where absolute zero came from. That is the theoretically lowest possible temperature. At that temperature, this data predicts that the volume of the gas would be zero. Could it get smaller than that? No, you can't have a negative volume. You can't turn space inside out. Okay, so that's the lowest possible temperature. This equation, um, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. If you had a negative temperature in there, then one of the volumes would have to be negative. That's not going to work out very well. And what if you had zero? What if you were doing this in ice water and your temperature was zero? You can't divide by zero, right? It's undefined. This relationship does not work with Celsius. It only works with Kelvin. And a common mistake is for students to do all the calculations very beautifully, but forget to change it to Kelvin. And the thing is, we measure temperatures in, cal in degrees Celsius. And so in the questions and the problems, they'll give you temperatures in degrees Celsius, They'll ask you for the answer in degrees Celsius. You have to convert it to Kelvin before you stick it into the equation. Here's something you could try at home. Demonstrating Charles' law, relationship between temperature and volume of a gas. So take a balloon and partially fill it with air, um, put it in some ice water, and it will shrink take it and put it in boiling water and it'll grow. It'll get bigger. So high temperature, high volume. Low temperature, 
low value, volume. Mm -hmm. What if you have uh, a gas, in like a steel box, mm -hmm. and some really like thick, heavy metal box, mm -hmm. and you're able to heat it and increase the volume, but well, the metal if like would, like if you have a strong metal, would it not yield, or like what? what yeah, so if you had a rigid container that would not allow the gas to expand, and you increase the temperature, the volume couldn't change, but the pressure would change. Yeah. So when you're doing this with a balloon, the pressure is going to be the same because the balloon is being resisted by atmospheric pressure, which isn't changing. So why does the balloon do this? Well, in ice water, these molecules are going to be moving slower. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. So in cold water at cold temperatures, just like people feel sluggish when it's cold outside, it's, the particles are not moving as fast. When they're not moving as fast, they're not going to run into the container as often. And when they do, it's with less force. And so the pressure would be lower. So this balloon is going to expand or contract to keep the pressure the same. So in order for the pressure to remain the same, the volume has to go down. If you dip a balloon in liquid nitrogen, it gets it really, so really small. That the air turns into liquid. Yeah, you can actually liquefy the air. Yeah. Um, but what also happens there if you dip a balloon into liquid nitrogen is the balloon rubber gets so brittle that it may just shatter. Liquid nitrogen is really fun. You can take a rubber ball and, and get it real cold in liquid nitrogen and throw it on the floor and it'll break like it was made out of glass. It's crazy. We can't do that in here. But we do have, coming up around Halloween, we'll have a science show and Dr. Bela will do that. Not with a ball necessarily, but he does it with flowers and all kinds of other fun things. Um, it'll be on a Friday out, out in the quad. I'll let you know about it. It's fun. Science show. So when you heat the gas up, the particles start moving faster. And in order for the pressure to remain the same, we're going to have to expand the gas. The volume has to expand. So this would be like um, giving the uh, kindergartners energy shots or something. Give them a rock star at lunch. And they're going to go nuts. They're going to be running faster, right? And if we want to keep the number of collisions the same, we're going to have to give them a bigger room to run around in. Okay, let's do a Charles Law problem. Oh, I kind of said that part. Yeah. Oh, forgot about this one. I remember being fascinated by this as a child. Hot air balloons. I mean, because children love balloons. We, we play with balloons, and you know that a balloon with helium will float, but if you just blow it up by blowing in it with your mouth, it won't float. Unlike on cartoons, where those balloons float too. But cartoons can just break all the laws of physics, and they do regularly. But here we have a balloon that's floating, even though it's got air in it, not helium, and it's got this big old hole at the bottom. And we know that a balloon with a hole in it does not stay inflated. It just gets flat, right? So what the heck is going on here? Heat. So we've got this giant burner here. So the burner is heating the air. What does air do when it gets heated? What does the volume do? It expands. Because this, this balloon is open to atmospheric pressure. The pressure inside it's going to be equal to the pressure outside. But we increase the temperature, the volume expands. Well, if the volume of the gas is bigger and the mass of the gas is the same, what does that do to the density? It lowers the density. Something with a low density will float in something with a higher density. That's why wood, styrofoam, things like that float in water. They're less dense than water. Things can float in gases also. So this balloon will float because the air inside is less dense than the air outside that's cold. And you can control the vertical movement by changing the temperature 
of the gas. So if you stop heating it, it just slowly Yeah, if you stop heating it, it will cool down and then you'll come down. And so you'd like to control that, of course. Let's do a problem here. A gas in a cylinder with a movable piston has an initial volume of 88.2 milliliters. If we heat the gas from 35 degrees Celsius to 155 degrees Celsius, what is its final volume in milliliters? So this one is more straightforward. Uh, for most of these problems, I find it very helpful to make a little table to organize the information. So we're gonna make a table here. And I'm just gonna collect numbers. So here we have 88.2 milliliters. So I'm gonna put that in here, 88.2 milliliters. So that's gonna be a column in my table. And I know because they told me it's volume and also because milliliter is a unit of volume that this is a volume. So I'm gonna collect all the volumes in one column. So volume of that. And then we're gonna heat the gas from 35 to 155. This is the initial volume, so I want to put the temperature with it, right? I need to pair these up correctly. So when it was 88.2 milliliters, the temperature was 35. And then I changed the temperature to 155, and I'm trying to find the final volume. So this is temperature, this column. Is degrees Celsius an okay unit to use here? No, we have to change it to Kelvin. So the relationship is that Kelvin equals the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. The book is a little sloppy about it. Um, here, here we have temperatures that are just to the nearest one degree. So if you want to use just 273 here, that's going to be just fine. If you're a purist and want to use 273.15, you can do that also. So I'm just going to use 273. Don't try to do these in your head because it's sad to get it wrong because of that. So this is 308 Kelvin. And then 155 plus 273 is 428 Kelvin. As soon as you write down degrees Celsius, change that temperature to Kelvin because you're going to have to. So I have volume and temperature. I'm going to call the first row one and the second row two. It's very creative. So I have this nice little table here and I have an empty box. That's what I'm solving for. It's column V and row two, so I'm going to call it V2. This is V1, that's T1, and this is T2. It's asking me to find the final volume. So this is the volume at the end. Now the one and the two do not have to reflect initial and final, but you just have to pair them up correctly. So we're gonna use Charles Law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. This equation has fractions in it, and some of you don't have a good relationship with fractions. So what you should do is you should get rid of the fractions before you start rearranging the equation. And we do that by cross multiplying. Cross multiplying, you take the top of one side times the bottom of the other, and that will be equal to the bottom of the first side times the top of the other side. Kind of makes an X. So V1 times T2 is equal to T1 times V2. Get rid of the fractions. Now I can take this equation and I can solve it for V2. So I'm going to divide this side by T1 so that the T1s cancel out. And I'm going to divide this side by T1 because you have to do the same thing to both sides. 
If you need help with rearranging equations, please ask me and I will work with you until it clicks for you. Um, there's going to be a lot of this and we can't just ignore it. So V2 equals V1 T2 over T1. Again, double check that you've got your numbers in the right places. Now we go to the table and we, we pull out the numbers. V1 is 88.2 milliliters. Put the units in there. The temperature, we want to use the Kelvin temperatures, uh, 428 Kelvin. And all of that's divided by T1, 308 Kelvin. See what the units are doing? The Kelvins are going to cancel each other out, so we don't have to do any converting there. 88.2 times 428 divided by 308. Whoops. 122.56. And that would be milliliters. Again, always do your best with sig figs. So here I've got three sig figs, three sig figs, and three sig figs. See, when we convert to Kelvin, because this is adding, this is to the nearest one, so this is to the nearest one. I started out with two sig figs, now I have three. That happens, it's okay. So all of these end up with three sig figs, and so I should keep three in my answer and report it as 123 milliliters. You can ask yourself, does this make sense? I heated this gas. Should it get bigger or smaller? It should get bigger. So this number better be bigger than what it started out as. There are other ways to solve problems like this. This is not the only way, but this is what seems to work best for most students. We're almost done. Hang in there. Avogadro's law. Remember Avogadro of Avogadro's number? He was born in 1776. He was the first one to formally state a relationship between volume of a gas and the amount of gas in moles. Volume is proportional to the number of gas molecules or particles. It's not proportional to the mass. It's proportional to how many particles there are. So Avogadro's law is typically expressed this way, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Volume and amount in moles are directly proportional. If you increase the amount of gas, you increase the volume, and that makes sense. If you put one breath of air into a balloon, it's a certain size, and then if you put another breath of air in there, it gets bigger, right? And again, here we're assuming that we're keeping the temperature and the pressure constant. I lost my pointer. There it is. So instead of counting individual gas molecules, we use the counting unit mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Equal volumes of gases contain equal numbers of molecules. That's not true of liquids and solids. If you have two gases, same volume, same temperature, they're going to have the same number of particles. Here's an illustration of Avogadro's law graphing volume versus number of moles in a nice linear relationship. If we extrapolate this data to zero, we find that um, we have a prediction that zero moles of gas would occupy zero volume. That makes sense, right? So we can do problems using Avogadro's law. A chemical reaction occurring in a cylinder equipped with a movable piston produces 0.621 moles of a gaseous product. If the cylinder contained 0.120 moles of gas before the reaction and had an initial volume of 2.18 liters, what was its volume after the reaction? Assume constant pressure and temperatures and that the initial, volume, initial amount of gas completely reacts. Lots of words. There's only three numbers in there, though. And the numbers 
are important, so let's pull those out. Let's make a table. So this is telling us that it produces 0.621 moles. So 0.621 moles. So what variable do we use for amount of gas in moles? N, lowercase n. Okay, so we had a reaction and this is what was made. If the cylinder contained 0.12 moles of gas before the reaction, okay, so I want to put that in the mole column, and had an initial volume of 2.18 liters. So 2.18 liters, does that go with the initial volume, or, I mean, the initial amount of gas, or the final? Yes. Goes with the initial. These two go together. So I'm going to put the 2.18 liters on the same line with the 0.120. And I'm going to call this column V. What was the volume after the reaction? So we're looking for the volume here. Now, if it makes you feel better, because down here, this is the initial condition and this is the final condition, you can call the bottom row one and the top row two, if that makes more sense to you. You're, we're gonna get the same answer no matter what we call them. So I need an equation that has N's and V's in it. And so that's Avogadro's law. N1, I'm sorry, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Fractions. If you're challenged with algebra, cross multiply, get rid of the fractions, then rearrange. So this is V2 that I'm looking for. So here's, here's kind of a shortcut way of rearranging equations like this. You can take something from the denominator and put it in the numerator on the other side. You can take something from the denominator here. You can go back and forth across the equal sign as long as you go at a diagonal. So we could switch these two. We could switch these two. I could put the N1 up here. I can do anything I want. I could show you how that works. You cross multiply and rearrange and it, it comes out the same. I want V2 by itself, so I'm gonna take this N2 and I'm gonna put it up there. I have rearranged the equation. V2 equals N2 V1 over N1. Now, if you need to do more in rearranging, absolutely do it. I'm going to plug the numbers in. 0 0.621 moles. Um, that's N2. And V1 is 2.18 liters. No, yeah, it's tricky, because this is N2, and this is N2. That's why labeling everything very clearly is helpful. So I've got 0 0.120 moles down here. You really need to show your work when you do these problems. The minimum is showing the rearranged equation, showing it with the numbers plugged in and their units, and showing the answer. So here my moles are canceling out. I've got 0.621 times 2.18 divided by 1.12. My calculator is giving me that number. I look at the numbers I was given, they're all three sig figs. 11.3 and the unit is liters. And then I can ask myself, does this make sense? I started with 0.12 moles, and now I've got more gas. The volume should get bigger, and it did. Any questions? One more fun one here. The scale model of a blimp rises when it is filled with helium to a volume of 55 cubic decimeters. 
when 1.1 moles of helium is added to the blimp, the volume is 26.2 cubic decimeters. How many more grams of helium must be added to make it rise? Assume constant T and P. This is another one that is not straightforward. Problem solving, critical thinking. Might need a picture, not that picture. Okay, so what we've got is a blimp, right? So here's my blimp, kind of looks like a big fish. Um, when the volume is 55 cubic decimeters, and that's a unit we haven't really used, it's okay, it floats. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it rise. Um, but what we've got is kind of a flattened one. We've put some gas into it. The volume down here is 26.2 cubic decimeters. And it contains 1.10 moles of helium. So that's N. So we might want to call this 1 and that 2. So this is N1 and V1, and this is V2. The question is not asking us how many moles of gas are in this when it floats. And it's not even asking us how many moles of gas do we need to add. It's adding us, asking us how many grams of helium do we have to add. We can't calculate that directly, but we can use Avogadro's law to find out what the amount of gas in moles is when the blimp is, is floating, right? So we could figure out what N2 is. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So N2 equals N1 V2 over V1. So N1 is 1.10 moles and V2 55.0 cubic decimeters divided by V1 26.2 cubic decimeters. What happens to the units? Decimeters, decimeters cancel out. Nice, because we didn't like the looks of those anyway. 1.1 times 55 divided by 26.2 and 2 is 2.30911 moles and that would have three significant figures. Is that how many grams of helium I need to add? No. That's how many moles of helium I need to have at the end. Well, we can convert to grams, but let's, let's figure out how many moles we need to add first. Because this is how many moles we have now, and this is how many we need to end up with. So we need to add 2.3091 minus 1.10. We already have 1.1, so that's going to equal 1.2091 moles. That's how much we need to add. Now we're going to convert that to grams. 1.2091 zero nine one moles of helium and hopefully this is kind of routine for you now converting grams to moles what's the relationship between grams and moles for helium 4.003 and moles cancel 
Well, that's not mole, that's mole. So times 4.003. 4.8402. Uh, I should have three sig figs. 4.84 grams of helium need to be added. Okay? Any questions?